You're locked into Inception Radio Network, Superior, Wisconsin. You're tuned in to Night Vision Radio, exposing the truth one secret at a time. Prepare yourself as we explore the shadow worlds of suppressed history, secret knowledge, forbidden religion, and shine a light on the conspiracies to keep it all from us. Vision Radio. Happy New Year, everybody. So glad you could join us tonight. I hope everybody's not too hungover today from partying last night for New Year's Eve. I cannot believe that it's 2015. It just really uh, blows my mind. Uh, 2014, I'm still getting used to writing that on, well, I don't even write checks. Who writes checks anymore? But on anything, I'm really still trying to get used to 2014. I guess uh, that's gone by the wayside now, and we're in a brand new year. I hear it's going to be a good one from all the predictors, so I'm hoping that that's true for all of us. Anyhow, tonight we've got a, a great show planned. You know, our last show that we were live, because last uh, last Thursday night was Christmas, so we were not live. But the previous Thursday night, we had on Don Ecker, a former research director of UFO Magazine, host of uh, UFOs Tonight and Dark Matters Radio, uh, on. We talked about some of the historical UFO cases, some of our experiences at UFO Magazine, and tonight, I have Don's better half, the first lady of UFOs, the founder or co-founder, I should say, of UFO Magazine way back in 1986, Ms. Vicki cooper Ecker. Vicki, thanks so much for joining us on your New Year's Day. Very much appreciated, and I wish everyone a very happy New Year. Hopefully, 2015 is going to be just a tad better, if not a whole lot better, from last year. Oh, I sure, I sure hope so. I'm, I'm getting a late start. I just uh, put my black eyed peas on uh, oh, yes. about an hour or so ago. So, <laughs> so I got to have my black eyed that. peas before midnight tonight, so I can have good, good luck in oh, all of wonderful. 2015. But I know Don was telling me how you guys had a traditional Pennsylvania New yes. Year's meal. And a lot of I, roast pork. It was delicious. Ooh, yeah. And so now I'm getting my ham and black-eyed peas thing together, and I'm going to make some cornbread and have a little bit before midnight tonight. So you'll have to come by and get some, Vicki. Um, you yeah, I will. You've asked me to, and I plan on it. Oh, absolutely. Now, Definitely. Let's let's just start at the beginning here a little bit. You uh, were a journalism graduate of UCLA, is that right? Oh no, not you. UCLA is slightly more prestigious than Cal State LA. Cal State, hey, Although that's I, fine. I do believe at that time. I don't know about journalism, you know, uh, majors these days, but we we were given the uh, the absolute standards of journalism, which I've tried to abide by in my career, short as it may be, have <laughs> been. So that's always been what I really admired about you and what I admired about the magazine, uh, you know, when I first picked it up. It was, you know, what by anybody's standards, uh, a very smart read. It was a very journalistic approach to what was considered a very, very fringe subject. And I really appreciated that because you it, it allowed you to or allowed the reader to sort of be able to depend on the information that they were getting and to make sure that they were getting a balanced view. Exactly. And that's exactly how I was taught as a journalism major and tried to apply that to a field that really wasn't ready for that kind of coverage. And I, don't, I still think it's not quite ready for that, uh, nor are most journalists ready to confront what uh, Sherry and I, Sherry Stark, my co-founder, 
had to deal with in the earlier years. Uh, it, it is a fringy subject, probably always will be unless there is some kind of disclosure uh, of what the government knows, if not the entire information about uh, UFOs. Uh, and it's, it was a challenge. And it, Don, my husband, God bless him, he has, he has to keep reminding me that we did something that um, nobody else has ever done. We actually published pretty much continually a, a legitimate UFO magazine, which had never been done before, now, maybe it'll happen again, but uh, at this point, you know, it's hard to tell. It doesn't look like the field has changed that much. Still a lot of crap, and uh, which is exactly what drove me out of it, to tell you the truth. It's just so filled with disinformation, with pettiness, uh, with, you know, people getting diverted off the phenomenon and into little fights about, uh, you know, tangential subjects it's it was frustrating it's true and, but you know don't you think that's true of a lot of different groups and yes, subjects you're absolutely right it is it, it, it is in fact if i'd gotten into any other subject to try to cover as a journalist i probably would have run into the same kinds of elements it's just that with the ufo thing because there's no standards because there are, are no academic agreements, shall we say, or scientific agreements, uh, the fighting goes on forever and there's never any uh, solid answer or any solid um, uh, resource that you can depend on, which is what we were trying to do, is to just present what we knew and what the people that were uh, the better researchers in the field had discovered and just presented in a very um, unemotional a nonpartisan kind of way, and uh, that might have been the reason, by the way, since we didn't take an attitude that the magazine never had an opportunity to really get financially successful. But that's but that's that's the way it was. Whatever. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I kind of I kind of hear what you're saying on that. Sometimes people want the shocking stuff. They want oh, the sure. controversy. Yeah. They want uh, you know that kind of a thing. They you know, and I found that you know, like like you're saying. Uh, a lot of the researchers, you know, were just average Joes like everybody else. And they were, you know, finding stuff on their own. And I would find a lot of times, I don't know if you, if you agree with this, but when sometimes the first kernel of what they had or what they found was fairly pure. But once they started getting attention on it and people started sort of grabbing onto it, it's like they wanted to keep it going. So yes. there was a lot of embellishment and a lot of misinformation, uh, you know, just to keep the story going. Very human reactions. You yeah. almost can't blame some of them. Uh, many people, if not most people, are naive to begin with, and they get into this subject with so f fraught with, with mystery and confusion, and they find something that is a kernel of truth, and it's natural, and if they get attention for that, it's natural, totally natural for most of us to take it and run with it, you know? And uh, so, you know, I can't fault people now that I look at it in hindsight. Hindsight being 2020 vision, of course. Sure. But at the time, it was like sometimes I didn't know how to deal with a, a certain case or a certain um, person I was interviewing. It was, it was, uh, Don did better with it. He, he, he was able to, he had more patience, uh, with some of these people that would go off on tangents that weren't, in my view, okay, just, totally my personal opinion, weren't quite sane, okay? <laughs> weren't quite sane. They weren't like, they were one enchilada, t you know, shy of a total combination plate, as they say. And uh, I just had very little patience with that. And people like that would call into the magazine, and, and I would fortunately have Don to pass it on to, because you never know. Or me. So what, yeah, yeah, or you. <laughs> right. Of course, I came By a little way, bit later. this girl here was my managing editor, and, and like my husband, Don, was one of the people that kept me going when I was way beyond being able to go on by myself. Oh, we had a great <laughs> Thank time. you for that, by the way. But I remember Renee. when we used to, to mail out each and every magazine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> In your living hey, you know room, what? your At living room was now? like full of magazines and envelopes and mailing labels and oh my god, it was insane. 
We did it by hand. I'd have them off myself to the UPS, and that's why I still don't have two floppy upper arms. <laughs> I, would pick, I would pick up those boxes, and I'd have them, and I was so proud of being able to do that in oh, my, my middle goodness. years. <laughs> yeah. But thank God you finally did hire a fulfillment house, and we didn't have to yes. do that Oh, anymore. yeah, we did, sure. And <laughs> Sherry helped with that, too. You know, she... Sherry, Sherry did a lot of things that, that really kept the thing going on the earlier years. And then we had, we gravitated into uh, associations with other people, shall we say. I guess they are people, <laughs> which took us in, in into some other mystery zones beside the UFO thing. But it, it all went where, it went according to what life it could have. And I look back on it knowing that it was uh, something that sustained a lot of people who are interested in the subject. And to me, that was that's really what I wanted to do. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, I, 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 um, I miss working on it. It was a lot of fun. And I, I can remember a lot of deadlines. Uh, a lot of deadlines, yeah. Working, you know, writing stuff at midnight or editing something at midnight. Uh, but it was fun. It was really good. Um, now, did you have a favorite time? Was there a favorite era of the magazine? And, and if you did, what was going on during that time in the field? Now you're going to find this very interesting, Renee. It's an interesting question. Because what you're asking me about is when the idea first came to me and uh, the state of mind I was in when I first went to Sherry and presented the idea to her. And that was subsequent to um, what I call kind of a transformative experience that I had after an accident, in which I had a great deal of uh, a spiritual uplift. And at the same time, and this I could never figure it out, I still haven't quite figured it out, I felt what I thought was a, some kind of connection to extraterrestrial intelligence. Now, I am not want to talk like one of those people that is a channeler or anything like that. It wasn't like that. It was just like a rapport with the idea of living systems or organisms outside of planet Earth. And, like, let's face it, it's a given. <laughs> this universe oh, is a yeah. given. You know, and but it, for some, you know, it's never been a subject that people openly accept and just realize is an inevitability for whatever reasons. But I did, and I at that time wanted to take my skills as an editor and writer and apply them to something that that inspired me. And that, to me, when the birth of the magazine first happened, was the most exciting time. Sherry and I were in rapport about uh, so many things. Uh, and we really saw, what was interesting is we saw the subject from a vantage point of upliftment for mankind, okay, an optimistic, uplifting, futuristic, happy, kind, and I don't want to say happy, but, but just positive kind of subject. Then we discovered the UFO field, <laughs> which mm. is in it, okay, so there was a conflict in me between my uh, desire to open up the public, the, the earthly public, to this wonderful idea that there are intelligences outside of our planet uh, that was in conflict with the actual people who were doing the research and doing their little things and being in their little uh, mud holes of fighting and stuff. It just didn't, it didn't, uh, didn't mix, really. But... We kept going and kept trying to mix it, but the whole spiritual part, the part of that made me feel uplifted and uh, positive about the idea that we have uh, other beings we can know about, that kind of went away as I kept trying to cover the field. So you see, there was a, mm. it, it, in other words, it started high and it dipped a little, and then it got a little higher when it looked like the business was going well and, and there were more positive elements in the field. And then it went down again. For me, it's like... Miles. Down and dirty. <laughs> yeah, down and dirty. Well, see, down and dirty is something I don't handle very well. <laughs> so, oh, God, I'm telling you again, I have to say, it wasn't for people like you and for Don. I just, uh, I, I might have been able to go on longer, maybe, if I had had a little bit more temerity in my soul with well, this what's stuff. what's interesting it, is, or at least it seems to me, I'm, uh, um, is that, your original 
sort of raison d'etre, your, your re- original idea for how you wanted to cover the, the subject matter in a positive way, it seems like now would be more of a time for that kind of coverage. Do you think so? Really? I think so. I think people are more into those ideas. In yeah, fact, no, I mean, even like uh, just looking, you know, at the chat room, people were talking about UFOs and Christ consciousness and spirituality. Mm-hmm, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. So I think that people have gotten more into that type of thinking. I, you know, could be completely wrong, but I think a, a lot of people have sort of um, I think I was listening to something on NPR today or maybe yesterday about religion and how people have sort of gotten more away from the sort of organized religion thing and more into spirituality. They can they don't consider themselves religious, but they consider them spir- s- themselves spiritual. spiritual which and is when far they're... more valid in my mind. It's far more well, valid yeah. in terms of connecting. And for me too, and I, and also, I think that opens people up to be able to, without those dogmas and laws and rules, that right. religion superstitions. If you ask me, there's a lot of superstition in religion. Yeah, absolutely. So what, uh, what you know, what without that, I think people are able to sort of entertain bigger and better things. Maybe. Yeah, Ooh, let's trying see, to what, connect that with the phenomenon, though. Yeah, uh, somebody... when you have a whole, there's an old whole institution, uh, though it's not accredited or even considered, you know, legitimate per se, uh, huh. of people following the subject. It, it, sometimes it's just difficult to bring in the spiritual aspect of it and also cover the field, you know. Yeah. Um, but still, it's it's it, we're all progressing. Everything's progressing. Mankind is progressing, and maybe our viewpoint on how we can bridge these things will inevitably come to some kind of fruition. It'd be great. Maybe so. Um, from the chat room, Bill says, uh, does Vicki think that Hollywood with all these negative alien movies is helping prevent <laughs> disclosure by using fear? Well, hey, fear really sells. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. Hey. I, maybe unintentionally, I, I think, you know, because, I mean, honestly, I, I, of course, I don't, move in those kind of uh, uh, of stratospheres, you know, among the Hollywood elite, but I do work in Hollywood, and I have, yeah, yeah. you know, worked, you know, in television for a long time, and then, you know, worked in movies a little bit. Uh, I don't, and and also worked at the magazine for, for years, so I never felt any pressure from any government body or any, to, you know, move information one way or the other and i know and i know people accused our magazine of that but it never yeah. really happened on a conscious level i can tell you that yeah. but then again the ufo phenomenon i think is pretty much uh there is a psychological warfare element in there or manipulation if not warfare maybe warfare is uh, a little too extreme and yeah. uh yeah, i've felt a little of that in my years uh with the magazine but it is so ephemeral, there's no way to really uh, prove anything. Uh, you know, it's like it was a feeling or an intuition and uh, might have been part of why I I backed off. Yeah. Uh, it seems like there was a time, you know, back in uh, like the mid-80s, I believe it was 1986 when I first saw you in uh, Las right. Vegas at that <laughs> MUFON conference. And I remember... Uh, there was a lot going on, a lot. There was uh, people were up in arms, you know, at that conference. There was all kinds of uh, of controversy. There was uh, talk of, you know, disinformation. There was the, you know, the Benowitz case and, yes, and right. right. other cases. And in, in, I believe it was Bill Moore that was on stage who admittedly participated in uh, disinforming Paul Benowitz, if not others, uh, and uh, into helping him believe, I guess, that he was having some experiences that maybe he wasn't having. I remember him calling it getting into the center of the beehive, which what what he meant by that as a researcher and quasi-spy, he was able to infiltrate up to a point some of the government uh, mix-ups and disinformation uh, that was being plowed into the field, and which eventually 
uh, nearly destroyed Benowitz and I guess fed into his uh, psychological breakdown. And uh, to know, I remember being there, to know that that man that was, quote-unquote, a fairly respected researcher, Bill Moore, uh, at the time had participated in operations uh, toward and against Benowitz in order to get to the center of the beehive totally freaked me out, totally devastated me. (laughs) I was appalled. I walked out. I know. (laughs) I was... Well, I remember the that, now, this, is a, this. This, this is the first time I ever I ever saw you, and I remember <laughs> Bill Moore was on stage, and I heard someone yell out, "What about the Constitution?" <laughs> and I said, "Who's that?" And and they said, "Oh, that's Vicky Cooper. She's the editor of UFO Magazine." And I was going, "Oh, wow!" And um, <laughs> it was very oh, heated in that room. I remember, but. Um, the Paul Benowitz case, can you talk just a little bit about what that is for those who might not be familiar with it that would be listening? Well, I, from what I remember, and please forgive me, my memory's not um, up to par as it was when I was, say, 20. Uh, Benowitz was a scientist um, who basically had, had worked on some covert projects vis-a-vis uh, the Air Force um, and um, covert projects and uh, had what was allegedly his own research into a alien, an alien UFO event. And um, Bill Moore and others uh, basically felt that he was compromising national security at some point, okay, from what I gather now. Now, if you had Don here instead of me, I'm certain he'd have all the details. But to make the long story short, when the AFOSI, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, decided he was compromising national security, they decided to go after him and to dissuade him from telling stories uh, about um, humans humans being uh, attacked and eaten by aliens, which I think was part of when his mental breakdown might have happened. Whatever went on and whatever he was doing, to make the long story short, Moore uh, hooked up with the AFOSI and proceeded to do projects, operations on this man. Now, that, was he a private citizen at that time, Moore? I believe he was. I believe he, I think he was, uh, if I had a, um, you know, my research notes, which I don't, I think he was a contract employee. And uh, I don't know exactly what his uh, uh, mission was, what his um, operations uh, as a uh, contract employee were at the time, but they were for high tech and for covert operations and for R&D. And just the fact that he was dealing in those levels made him dicey uh, as somebody who would be talking too much to, to, to the wrong people. And uh, bottom line, he was considered somebody in the UFO field who was intentionally targeted by operatives of the Air Force Office of Special Investigation and ultimately was driven uh, psycho a bit or insane because of it. And this, of course, was an outrage. Once Bill Moore came out and said he was a part of it, uh, the UFO community, as insular and small as it was, was pretty upset to know that he was dealing with who many people considered at the time the enemy. Because the enemy was the uh, various intelligence agencies were, who were attempting to keep a lid on the phenomenon, the fact that the phenomenon is real. Not necessarily that the phenomenon was alien, or ET, but that, that it was real, that people were seeing things, and their denial, particularly around the CIA and uh, those, those agencies, uh, was simply a, a dissuasion for everybody to get them off, uh, to get them to feel safer with the, with the security of their operations. And, uh, yeah, that's another thing. Uh, I started out thinking these UFOs, many of them or most of them, were ET or from alien intelligences or other dimensional intelligences, whereas as time went on, it was easy to discover that much of the stuff was infiltrated by uh, Air Force, CIA, intelligence agency operations that had to do with uh, research and development. And uh, 
you know, that, you know, things like, I think you were speaking earlier, Renee, of teleportation, Gordon Cooper having... Uh, oh, yeah, astronaut claimed. Gordon Cooper. I remember yes. uh, you interviewed him for the magazine. Right, This was, right. yeah, this was like probably early 90s. Right. It was a short time before he passed away. Yes. A few years, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, he, at that time, did claim to have, uh, well, he was open about having, uh, admitting or accepting the reality of UFOs and having seen some uh, certain in, uh, individual experiences that he had along with some other pros in the aeronautics field. Um, but he also talked about teleportation. These things, if they were going on and they had to do R&D, naturally there would be things that the average citizen would see in the sky and not know how to interpret. And uh, that, it, it all gets into this big miasma, and that's where it started to get very difficult to color the field, you know. So, absolutely, yeah, it, it really was. Now, in Paul Benowitz, and we're going to have to take a break in just a moment. But uh, Paul Benowitz was uh, fed information. Is that right? But I remember there was a story about him seeing beings coming through the wall. Yes, yes, I remember that too. That kind of talk coming from somebody who's supposed to be a legitimate, you know, head-on straight kind of scientist that's a dealing with a large uh, governmental agency. This is this did not please the Air Force very much, okay? They didn't like it at all. Uh, but uh, Bill Moore exploited that problem by making friends with who he thought were the right people. And then mm-hmm. he ended up being involved with the, uh, the controversy of what ended up happening to Paul. You know, and it was, it was, these are the kinds of things that happened so much in the UFO field that really took everybody's eye off the ball. The ball being the phenomenon. What yeah. is it? Where does it come from? How can we break it down so that we can look at it as, as you know, smart human beings? And, and yeah. it's just too bad. But It is too it, bad. It is what it is. It was what it was. It will be what it will be. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, we're going to take a break. And you can take that to the bank, kid. Yep, yep, yep. We're going to take a break right now, and when we come back, we're going to be talking about uh, UFO magazine, UFO cases, the Philadelphia experiment, and much, much more. Stand by. Are you a fan of Inception Radio Network? Do you reckon it's the best alternative talk radio station on the planet? Well, if you do, head to facebook.com forward slash Inception Radio Network and like the page. Tell your friends, spread the word, and keep listening to the best. Hello, Inception Radio Network. Would you like your favorite show to be played again live on air? Well, now the choice is in your hands. With IRN's live request portal, an easy way to request your favorite show with a simple click. IRN's Live Request Portal now gives you exclusive access to all the shows. How easy is it? Simply type a show name or a guest name, click Request, even write a dedication message, and that's it. Try it now. Simply visit InceptionRadioNetwork.com, click on the Live Request tab under the Show menu. Now playing your favorite show is just a mouse click away. Don't have a computer? Is your internet connection down? Don't worry. Use your trusty cell phone or landline and call into our listen line at 401-283-6700 to listen to the Inception Radio Network 24-7. Again, that call-in number is 401-283-6700. For the Inception Radio Network, I am MJ. You didn't forget what's coming up tonight, did you? Hi, Inception Radio Network listeners. This is Amanda. Never miss that interview you were looking forward to or the show on your favorite topic. Follow IRN on Twitter, I underscore, R underscore N, and get reminders about the evening's live shows as well as fun and important updates throughout the week. That's I underscore, R underscore N, and never miss a great show again. Are you looking for a cure for boredom? Never worry. IRN's new interactive website introduces a number of ways to pass time while you listen to your favorite show. 
Choose anything from the IRN chat lounge, the game lounge, video lounge, or the mood lounge. These fun, exciting features let you chat in real time with fellow listeners, view live sky watches, play daily posts at online games, or pick a show based on topic. The choices are endless. Use your time wisely by keeping it all on IRN. Hey, IRN listeners, make sure you tune in to Night Vision Radio with Renee Barnett. Renee will be exposing the truth one secret at a time. When? Thursdays. Every Thursday, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, 7.30 p.m. Pacific. Where? Right here on IRN. Welcome back, everybody. You are here on Night Vision Radio. I am your host, Renee Barnett. And we're talking with Vicki Cooper Ecker, co-founder and editor-in-chief for over 20 years of UFO Magazine, the one and only journalistic approach to the fringe subject of UFOs. Gee, that sounds so impressive. <laughs> Doesn't it? See? Oh, totally. you gotta, That means you got to do it again. Me? Oh, yeah. It was me. Yeah, somebody, we were just talking about Paul Benowitz. I see people are talking yeah. about it in the chat room. And uh, Neutron says that Benowitz's life was ruined by Doty. Oh, Bob Doty. Was, yeah, the U.S. Mm-hmm. misinformation officer or for the military or what was right. his? Yeah, That's, I believe that is, is who Bill Moore hooked up with. Wasn't he and high? Together. Doty, wasn't he pretty high ranking? Oh, yeah. I don't remember what his rank was, but he was definitely in there and doing some important work or what they thought was important work at the time. And uh, But but he was a very controversial figure in the field. Uh, there were these people. Uh, Stubblebine was one of them, Doty. And I, uh, there's a few others whose name I can't recall that actually did have their feet in both the intelligence community and in UFOs. There was such a crossover, uh, that, and it, it is one of the areas that uh, kept things on edge all the time with people in the field. And Doty, Doty was, I remember, one who was basically despised by <laughs> most of the researchers in the field because of being a uh, nosy, intrusive disinformation agent, and mm. uh, one that was, uh, you know, backed up by the Air Force to begin with, so... Well, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, about Paul Benowitz and and how I remembered one of the stories was, you know, that he claimed that he was seeing aliens, you know, coming in through the walls, alien beings. And was the was the idea that he was possibly really having some kind of experience or was it that he was having a a mental breakdown at that time well that's that's hard to say i believe before he was considered someone that was like having a mental breakdown he was having these experiences and though i never heard it being said outright it's possible he was a victim of psychological operations Mm -hmm. uh whether they could um mimic something like aliens coming through the wall, that I really don't know. Uh, probably nobody in the civilian community knows. But he, he basically was somebody that, that was seeing stuff that the uh, Air Force didn't want him to broadcast. And uh, the uh, who knows? This, the fact of the matter is, if there are ET aliens that have interfaced and are interfacing with our planet, they have capabilities such as uh, tra- teleportation, disappearing, uh, in- intrusion into people's minds and, and brains uh, for their own uses. And certainly one of the things that Don and I and you, too, remember are the many, many instances of people who have had direct experience with either alien abduction or uh, memories of lights coming through their windows, that sort of thing. Uh, there is a phenomenon out there, and whether it crosses over into paranormal, you know, spooks, things from other dimensions, or whether it's actual, you know, three-dimensional beings coming from another planet, it, it all is outside of our spectrum of consciousness, and it deals with our consciousness. And I, I think that largely the psychological part of it is is probably, instead of what... Uh, 
Bill Moore was going for is the center of the beehive. I do believe it's a manipulative thing. In fact, if anybody wants to uh, read whom I think is the most uh, sharp author and the most willingly open to the possibilities out there and also the most articulate, read Jacques Vallée. Jacques Mm. Vallée, without, without question to me, has penetrated the phenomenon in a way that most, uh, na- uh, what is it, uh, uh, hammer and nails researchers have not been able to do. He, mm. he does look at the manipulative psychological part of it, and it is a big part of it. And I, I you know, to this day, uh, as much as my interest in UFOs was long lasting, I, I still have a part of me that doesn't want to go too deeply into looking at it because I realize it does affect the mind. And it affects uh, people. Some people have stronger minds than others. I don't think mine is that that strong. And it was was uh, certainly bolstered by Don and you, and others who came to me uh, over the course of the years. Um, it's just it's just one of those fields that has no um, hard and fast resources. Everybody yeah, it's like has you, their you, own you can't really get to the bottom of it. Or exactly. Something. It's like it's bottomless. Exactly. You, 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 or you pick up a thread and you think you're getting somewhere and then it and ends then up just frayed. leading nowhere. <laughs> or, or, yeah, yeah, or, or it, it ends off up in another that's direction. That, actually, that, uh, that's, that's exactly what happens. And so for a journalist, for somebody who really wants facts, who really wants to present non, you know, uh, objective facts, it, it could, couldn't be a worse kind of uh, subject to try to deal with, you know, it's just, it, because the real facts are not there other than the, other than the quote-unquote fact that people have experiences uh, that are out of the realm of the norm, and they swear they're real to them, and they are suppressed by the powers that be, and when they are not suppressed, the powers that be will go in there and screw it up so that nobody can get a straight line of information. And and that, that bottom line is why I, I just had to throw my hands up and said, I'm gone. <laughs> okay, that's it. No more. Mm. No more. Yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned Jacques Vallée and, and just earlier, in, uh, a little while ago before the break, someone had brought up, uh, I believe it was Neutron asking whether or not... Uh, the magazine had ever done anything on uh, the work of Barbara Bartholik and Carla Turner, and oh, yes. I def yeah I, I absolutely yep. remember remember that. And then he just mentioned that that Barbara Bartholik worked, he says, seven years with Jacques Vallée, which I did I didn't recall that. I didn't know that either, huh? But now uh, I remember the Carla Turner. Uh, stuff very well uh barbara barth like a little less so uh did you cover that carla wrote a book yes okay i don't remember uh the actual information in the book but i do remember it was quite controversial and she wrote an article now see here's the deal that article is somewhere in my garage <laughs> among wow. the the many, many magazines that are in my garage. Yeah. But at this point, I have no recollection of exactly what her experience was. I do know it was considered hinky, but then so are a lot of uh, the uh, abduction and or contact experiences that right. we covered. You know, people, you, this is this is a disturbing thing, and this is the troubling part of it. Um, she probably had a real and possibly very terrifying experience. I'd ha- now I'm interested in going back into the into my garage and seeing if I can find her. Yeah, absolutely. Her story. She also wrote a book anyway, and it wasn't and, long after that she passed away. Right. And, I know. Uh, I remember she had cancer, but there was also, right. you know, a lot of con- conspiratorial talk uh, about. It could have you been know, my labs. Maybe she was one of the first that did my. You know what my labs are? Right. Yes. Militarily. Yeah. Military. Yeah, Go ahead and explain that, though, to listeners that well, might not be Well, basically familiar. what it is, is uh, from what my uh, memory will, is really being difficult turning up here, <laughs> mm-hmm. military operations uh, that were actually uh, hoaxed abductions, hoaxed um, mm. contact events, okay, 
and they were experiments that were being done on the covert by our military uh, for the sake of simply trying to get more information about what was going on in the field and with the people in the field. And several people, uh, researchers in the field, became experts in doing my lab coverage, which we had in the magazine also. I can't yes. remember exact names at this point, though. And uh, basically, they, the military has infiltrated uh, the subject and has, has uh, exploited the subject in order to keep their security where they feel it should be. It's a huge bureaucracy. And it all comes down to people who have not had experiences, whether in the military or not, dealing with people they think are just a little off, okay, or crazy, and making sure that whatever comes out of that, those people, the, the experiencers, doesn't disrupt the boundaries of R&D or whatever else they're trying to keep secret. For all we know, and if you were to go back into the history of UFOs, the phenomenon is real, has been real for a long time, has been suppressed for a long time, Roswell et al., okay, and has been uh, sullied, poisoned, intoxicated with so much disinformation that nobody who is an average citizen with an average mind can make their minds up of whether they want to know any more about it or not, are either filled with fear or distrust or just plain... Uh, dismissive these people are fucking nuts excuse my language okay <laughs> you know but that i'm i'm telling you what what is it that um the, the uh, researcher up in canada uh, stanton friedman calls the uh laughter curtain the laughter curtain is as steady and as sturdy as ever you know uh and it's a shame it's a, it's a, it's a definite shame because i think if science was really to try to get into it in a way that could be shared with the rest of the American people, if not the world, we'd have, we would be able to move this planet into a new phase. Uh, but it ain't happened, you know? And it, mm. uh, as, I think that discouragement is also part of why I never could really stick with the subject. So. Wow. I don't want to be depressive or anything. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it's interesting, but I, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad somebody brought up Carla Turner because I hadn't thought of her in quite no, I some time, mm -mm. and uh, I do remember that. I remember Don worked on that story, I believe. Did Didn't he? he? Oh, yeah, he might have. He does. I think he she... covered that on on the magazine. I'm pretty sure uh, he he'll, he'll he remember if he did. It, yeah, he would do. Uh, he did coverage of her experience, and then at one point she wrote an article. So now, uh -huh. speaking of, you know, we did have a lot of people that you know came our way during that time, and you even more so because you were there a lot longer, of course. Uh, but what were the what is the the most, I guess, uh, credible case that you that comes to mind for you when you think in terms of alien abduction or experience? That's a tough one. Uh, alien abduction or interaction. Well, I don't know. I remember Don told you about what's going on with the Rendlesham thing. Uh, well, I know that uh, he. We did talk briefly when Don was on a couple weeks ago about Larry Warren and right uh, and um, him being, you know, sort of slandered by um, by Car Colonel Halt. Halt, yeah, Halt, and yeah. Uh, yeah, and so uh, yeah, we did know about that. Now, what's what can you add to that? Because we didn't get into well, a lot of it. Well, basically, again, it's an uh, example of how in this field, of, as it were, people get their eyes taken off the ball by little conflicts, controversies, slight uh, ethical violations, that sort of thing. Uh, Halt has accused um, Larry of drug-taking, and some of the tapes that Bud Hopkins did of his regression of the Rendlesham. Rendlesham Forest was, is in Britain, and there was a, a, bit, a UFO event, which was seen by several people, Larry Warren being one of the people that was most um, vocal about what well, he it was. Well, it, it was an American 
air base at the time. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, and nuclear, nuclear, nuclear weapons. Yeah, nuclear uh, weaponry was, was oh, housed yeah. there. And so there was a, a bunch of Americans there. And, you know, one night in December, they had uh, a, a series of evenings of experiences. And um, I guess, you know, that is probably some of the best evidence because there were so many military personnel. Yeah, some of them haven't been named, but there were military personnel uh, Larry Warren, I'm not sure exactly what his role was there at the time, but uh, he spilled the beans on something that was considered very uh, sub rosa, uh, at least according to the military, probably both uh, Americans and the British. And for that, he got himself in a little bit of trouble. It looked like Colonel Halt, because uh, he had expressed Halt's presence being there, his, uh, Halt's... Uh, career in uh, the Air Force was, was, the Royal Air Force was uh, threatened, and uh, so he took back, he, you know, came back at Larry Warren by accusing him of, of being a drug taker, and so now there's this little tempest in a teapot, and the actual, what has happened, we're diverted away from the fact that there was some kind of uh, UFO-oriented experience on an, a nuclear-armed air base, okay, <laughs> to a little squabble between uh, Larry and this colonel, and these are the kinds of things that really, really are fabulous for the people that want to keep the laughter curtain and the misinformation off top of the phenomenon, because it takes people's attention away from the phenomenon and puts it on personal squabbles or whatever, okay? And it, that, that, to me, is one of the big failing of the field. If the field could keep its eye on the ball, and and don't let these petty things get in the way. We would get a little farther. When I say we, it's the generic we because I'm not a part of this anymore. But there are still good researchers out there. And uh, Rendlesham uh, is maybe one case that had some really good backing. Uh, there was other ones that seemed good at first, like um, I can't remember her name, but there was one that Ben Hopkins uh, ended up being hugely controversial. Oh, um Linda Cortillo. Lin- yes. Linda Napolitano. Yes. Linda or, yeah. Napolitano, right, right. And all these things took everybody away, from, pulled everybody away, if they allowed themselves to be pulled away, mainly because if you were to be pulled to the ball, the UFO phenomenon, you had a lot mm-hmm. of emptiness there that you had to, to, to dive through to find anything. It, so basically, this was not a subject that was set up for a legitimate uh, journalistic approach. Uh, we gave it the good uh, good college try, though, and mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what we did. Now, and nobody ever did it before, as Don will tell me all the time, or we'll yeah. probably do it after, but whatever. So. Yeah, you know, that, that Linda Napolitano slash, you know, Cortillo, I think was... Cortillo, were, right, right. One of them was her real name, and the other one was the name that was used in the book. Yeah, I think um, Napolitano was her real name, but I, I'm not, I don't remember. And I remember that story because it was uh, it happened in Manhattan, uh, New York City, and supposedly she was uh, floated out of her apartment window and beamed That's onto right. a ship right. and was seen supposedly by a UN official that oh, was you remember you good memory girl that was going down you know going down the road and i remember it was a big stir i remember there were like some pictures that were captured of her running down the beach being chased or something i don't remember but what did ever happen with that case you know, did I it think just, it just fizzle out. It just or? floated away into the universe like the rest of us did eventually. You know, they because people will hop from one case to the other. But Hopkins, uh, God rest his soul, passed away. Um, I don't know. I think it was the early two thousands. I can't remember. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was considered uh, a, a legitimate abduction regression uh, researcher, and yet his name was uh, brought up uh, with this Rendlesham thing. All these little. Uh, scandalous items get thrown onto certain cases. So if there was one that was real and it had some real validity, that had a trajectory that could be followed, something inevitably seems to come to these cases and mix them up and and pollute them to the point where even the most rigorous uh, digging researcher gets uh, 
thrown away into another a whole other area and uh it, it's really a pity it's only if if you know if someday if something happens that CNN, Fox News, CBS, NBC, ABC, et al. are forced to look at it, 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 you know, objectively, it's there, we can't miss it, then we may have some real progress. But I don't see anything happening before then, uh, unless there's just some, some dramatic change uh, mm. in the whole socioeconomic yeah. uh, system here. I. I- Two cases, you know, of abduction or experience uh, jump out at me when I think of, you know, because I've been, you know, I spent a lot of time looking into that subject. You know, I was one of the founders of CERO, Close Encounter Research right, Organization, right. with Yvonne Smith many years ago. And um, that was our whole thing was to look into that phenomenon and to help people that were going through it. And... I tell you, you know, there were people that I could tell really believed that they were having experiences. Some uh, seemed that they were. Some seemed that possibly they had some other things, you know, psychologically maybe going on. Right, right. Um, uh, But it was just really hard to sort of get to the bottom of. But in talking to people throughout the years, uh, the two cases that really jumped out at me were uh, Betty and Barney Hill and yeah, yeah. Right. And, and Travis Walton. And Another I re- one. Right. Yeah. And I remember, you know, I did uh, get a chance to get to know Betty a little bit, and we had some fantastic conversations. I mean, she was such a, a sharp lady, and uh, she was, you know, very outspoken and, and um, very salty. I really enjoyed our conversations. And she told me that she really uh, believed that Travis Walton's case was, was, was genuine. And, you know, another one that I kind of got into uh, a little bit less, but more recently I've been looking at, and uh, it was uh, the Betty Andreessen case. Right. That was a very, very good one. We did cover stories on both of those. Well, and, I just had uh, I had Betty and and her husband Bob on the show a few weeks ago. Oh, and, really? Yeah. Uh huh. They've got a new book uh, that's out that they have uh, written on their experiences and um, about their original experience, right? Yes, and ongoing. And I think oh, they you have know, subsequent subsequent experiences. Huh? Yeah, and 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 Bob. Um, you know, had his own separate experiences, and I think that's how they ended up getting together, uh, Bob Lucas. Well, that's another fascinating thing about the phenomenon, per se, uh, as it were, or whatever. Uh, it does seem to select certain individuals that have on, have continuing, ongoing experiences, which could lead one to think that perhaps there is a mental state or a certain configuration of the brain that lends itself to these contacts, whereas somebody else's configuration of mental state doesn't, you know. That's why the interplay between what could be considered uh, uh, hammer and nails reality and uh, a uh, uh, non-dimensional or undimensional, uh, other dimensional reality intersect in a way that makes, uh, you know, any kind of conclusions virtually impossible. And, uh, and, and it makes you wonder about the people that have these experiences. What is it about their mental state that causes them to almost be able to invite certain experiences? Speaking of invitation, that's what That's that. right. Well, you know, is it, could it be something uh, sort of in, in the same vein as some people have prophetic dreams? Some people yeah. have uh, psychic experiences. I know, you know, my mom does all the time, you know, she'll... Really? Oh, yeah. Like yeah. what? She's always hmm. in it. Oh, for instance, you know, like years ago, you know, when I was a kid, she would always know when something was wrong. Like, hmm. you know, I was out one day and I was with a boy. I was 15. <laughs> he was 16 and he let me drive his car. And I <laughs> hit a, I hit a man on a tractor. Oh, Thank dear. God he wasn't 
seriously hurt. He flew off the tractor and landed in the in the pasture, not on the highway, which was really good. But uh, anyhow, but anyhow, at, at the moment that now, that happened, uh, my sisters and my parents were at home, and my mom just looked up and said, "You know, she's been in an accident." And then when I walked in the wow. door a little bit late, I said, I'm sorry, I was in an accident. Everybody goes, oh, my God. I'll be darned. But things like that happened all the time. Something- well, now, what you don't want to say is things happen to you like that sometimes now, don't they, Renee? And that, you'll have to wait for another episode, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, I, I do remember that I used to, do you remember what I used to call myself when you would lose something at the office? I, really, am your, I can't remember what I had for breakfast. This I would morning. say I am your psychic finder. Oh, and that's I right. Would, I would always, you know, you would misplay something, and for some reason, I could always go right to it. That's I don't know why. Right. <laughs> I was your you psychic finder. Right in. I remember that. God, that's I didn't right. exploit your your talents the way I should have, did I? Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> but anyhow, um. Let's see. Uh, we've got about ooh two and a half minutes or so before the break, but let me see if I can get in a quick question from the chat sure. room. Someone's wanting to know what you think uh, about, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't remember who asked the question now. It's, I don't want to scroll back, uh, about what you thought about the Bob Lazar uh, story oh. and what you think about his return to the UFO conference tables this uh this is he year back, he's back to, is he back doing some talks you know i had just heard that uh fairly recently but i didn't you know i don't I, have that I, first heard, I think i read something about it on online somewhere but i just passed over it i thought that's interesting and that's about as far as it went but his experience vis-a-vis uh, a real reporter really added legs to what he what he claimed. And you're talking about George to, Knapp, of Exactly, course. George Knapp. KLAS. Uh, uh, probably uh, one of the most um, brave of uh, conventional broadcasters, although he's it's not just conventional, he's award-winning, uh, ever to have taken on the taken on the UFO subject, and through Lazar, went quite a distance with it. And Lazar claims to have seen uh, this sports model UFO uh, in the hallowed halls of the secret Area 51. I, like all other such stories, since I don't have uh, the ability to read minds or to really research far enough uh, to, to know, took it at face value. And I really did respect the fact that there was uh, a legitimate, hard-nosed journalist that was taking him seriously. Uh, the fact that he's back uh, talking about his experience now, I think, is great, as long as he's not compromising national security while he's doing so. And even if he is, for God's sake, it's about time we had some more people that really uh, scientifically understand some of the physics involved with how these uh, crafts could work, you know, sharing their sharing their information. Uh-huh. Uh, I can I would never try to say that I I believe him 100 percent because there's no way I could. I can't say that about anybody. Only well, myself. I had, I had the opportunity, uh, you know, to talk with him uh, several times. I don't know if you knew this, but for a time being, uh, my little production company uh, optioned his life rights for. Uh, Oh, did years. you? Uh-huh. And we got very, very close to a, a television movie about his story. Oh, that would have been great. It, uh-huh. Yeah, that would have been so, so neat. And then it fell apart but for political reasons, not anything to do with the government, just uh, the machinations of the movie business. But anyhow, uh, yeah, he, he always Never struck Never understood me. how you put up with that, Renee. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> uh, but he struck me as very credible. He really did. Um, anyhow, he talked to him a lot, yeah. Yeah, talking to him, is like sitting one-on-one, I'm sure that's how um, George was able to be convinced of his validity. Oh, I'm sure. It makes a big difference. It really does. Now, we're going to have to take another break. Can you believe it? We've already gone another half hour, and wow. we've got just one more to go. So we will be back shortly with Vicki Cooper Ecker and more Night Vision Radio. We'll be right back. listening to IRN, 
The Inception Radio Network, Chicago, Illinois. Computer? Is your internet connection down? Don't worry. Use your trusty cell phone or landline and call into our listen line at 401-283-6700 to listen to the Inception Radio Network 24-7. Again, that call-in number is 401-283-6700. For the Inception Radio Network, I am MJ. Do you have a smartphone? If so, Inception Radio Network is the best app for you. Available on iTunes, Android, Samsung, and most other app stores. Just search Inception Radio Network. With the app, you can listen live, check out podcasts of recent and past shows, view our videos, see what shows are coming up, who the guests are, and, via the chat room, send live questions to those guests. You know it makes sense. Check your app store now. Inception Radio Network. I'll see you there. for a cure for boredom? Never worry. IRN's interactive website introduces a number of ways to pass time while you listen to your favorite show. Choose anything from the IRN chat lounge, game lounge, video lounge, or the mood lounge. These fun, exciting features let you chat in real time with fellow listeners, view live sky watches, play daily posted online games, or pick a show based on topic. The choices are endless, so use your time wisely by keeping it all on IRN. Hi, Bob Tarmac for MJ'sHealthyWay.com. Are you into vitamins, nutrition, meal replacements, health shakes, uh, keeping your body in good shape, your internal engine going? (laughs) Boy, do I have a perfect place for you. MJ'sHealthyWay.com. They offer the best service and products, and they'll tell you anything you need to know about any product they have to offer. I get all my vitamins, meal replacements, shakes from MJ'sHealthyWay.com. That's spelled M-J-S HealthyWay.com. There's so much more at the website. Go check it out. MJ'sHealthyWay.com. Inception Radio Network listeners, this is Amanda. Just a reminder that Inception Radio Network is on Twitter. Follow us at I underscore R underscore N and keep up to date about who's on tonight, what interviews they'll be doing, who's guest spotting, what topics they'll be covering. Tweet to us, tweet about us, retweet topics to your friends, and most importantly, never miss a great show again. That's I underscore R underscore N. Are you a fan of Inception Radio Network? Do you reckon it's the best alternative talk radio station on the planet? Well, if you do, head to facebook.com forward slash Inception Radio Network and like the page. Tell your friends, spread the word, and keep listening to the best. Hello, Inception Radio Network listeners. Would you like your favorite show to be played live on air? Well, now the choice is in your hands with IRN's Live Request Portal, an easy way to request your favorite show with a simple click. IRN's Live Request Portal now gives you exclusive access to all the shows. How easy is it? Simply type a show name or a guest name, click request, and even write a dedication message. That's it. Try it now. Simply visit InceptionRadioNetwork.com. Click on the Live Request tab under the Show menu. Playing your favorite show is just a mass click away. Hey, IRN listeners, make sure you tune in to Night Vision Radio with Renee Barnett. Renee will be exposing the truth one secret at a time. When? Thursdays. Every Thursday, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, 7.30 p.m. Pacific. Where? Right here on IRN. Welcome back to Night Vision Radio. I'm your host, Renee Barnett. We're talking with Vicki Cooper Ecker. She is the co-founder and former editor-in-chief for more than 20 years of UFO magazine. I consider her the first lady of the UFO subject. And <laughs> I'm a little bit prejudiced, but that's okay. Uh, no, I, you know, looking back, I, I do remember, and I, I know we're sort of backtracking a little bit, but when I was working on the magazine with you, I remember you um, taught me the, I guess it's, what is it, the credo of the journalist credo 
something like that. Yeah. Comfort uh, the disturbed and disturb oh, the comfortable. Disturb the comfortable. Comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. Yes, exactly. Because that's what facts do. You know, when you get down to it, straight facts are hard for most people to take because they have a big belief. They have some kind of belief system that makes them feel comfortable in their day-to-day life. And you can't blame them. Everybody has it. I have it. I know for sure. And uh, to have startling facts about something that you cannot know whether it's helpful or harmful, like UFOs, and it certainly has been shown over the past that there's a harmful element to the UFO phenomenon. It it, it makes people just want to want to back off, and uh, but and it makes even more so the uh, reporter has to be brave, courageous to step out and make those facts known. And I think this is one of the big problems right now with our politics. Nobody wants to face the facts. I mean, basically, we want to remain complacent, and we have uh, huge numbers of new people coming to this country that also have a, a very narrow cast about what they want in life and what they want to know in life. And uh, this does not help. To, to me, it's like knowledge and knowing what's behind the the facade that we see every day is far more important than just being comfortable. Um, that's not to say that I don't aim for more comfort every day than anything else at this point in my life. Okay, sure. not to be sounding like I'm out there fighting for facts every day because I'm not. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't want you know, to. I don't want to come off sounding like I'm, uh, you know, some brave. Uh, um, journalist or something. I'm not anymore. So, but you know, we we've been, uh, you know, talking about this subject. I mean, we as a society uh, for a lot of decades now, That's and right. it's, you know, if it's true, which it can't be not true, um, because there's just too many people, too many witnesses, too much right. evidence, and it's just logical. Why would this little tiny planet, which is a in a fairly young, you know, solar system, a young planet, be the only one in the entire universe to have intelligent life? It just makes no it, it, sense. It, that's what I've, you know, and again, that was another uh, factor, big factor that lent me into going into the field of trying to do a magazine about it. There's no possible way. And anyone who thinks that has tied themselves up into an an egoic orientation that does totally contradicts reality. I mean, this, I don't know if you remember when the, the, the photos of the Hubble telescope came out that showed those things that looked like stars, which were actual galaxies. Do you remember yes. that? I would yes. go and look at those pictures. I would just, I'd call them up on my computer just to look at them to, to, to keep my perspective where I wanted it to be. And that, to me, is like, how can anyone look at that and hear what they are? Okay, we're hearing that these are not stars that you're seeing like when you're laying on the beach at night or in the desert. These are galaxies that this incredible, incredible mm-hmm. camera has caught for the benefit and the, and the joy of mankind. And you tell me that we're the only organisms on the planet, I mean, in the, in the universe, I'm yeah. sorry, does not wash. In fact, to tell you the truth, bottom line, Renee, I believe that there are extraterrestrials or beings that are from other places that are on this planet now. I have a feeling that they are in government, that they are in education, that they are in military, and uh, God knows uh, for sure probably the entertainment industry, okay? Uh, And uh, we just are not aware of it, nor are we necessarily have to be aware of it at this time. And it's not necessarily easy for them to be here either. And the ones that are here are making a great sacrifice, I would think, some of them anyway. Then there could be other ones that are here for nefarious purposes. And to me, this would not be at all a surprise. I I wouldn't be surprised if some of us have run across uh, alien beings. uh, We call them alien beings or ETs, whatever you want to call them, uh, at some time in our lives without ever knowing it. But uh, somebody knows it. Someone knows it. Yeah, somebody knows it. That's right. That's and, I, I mean, who, man, it? who knows it? Who, who knows it? I don't it? know the, the, who the, knows the, it, the, but the, I wish I did know who knows it. 
The Illuminati <laughs> or the Bilderbergers or yeah, you know, who right. knows it? Who does it? Well, certainly couldn't be Obama. Uh, <laughs> couldn't be, I don't know, maybe Steven Spielberg. Knows. It's maybe. I, but, I don't know. It's, it's, you know, it's all speculation to most of us at this point, but there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to freely explore it without the field being, or without the subject matter being sullied by outside influences that don't want people to know, the suppression that keeps us from knowing, at least clues, having little clues. The clues are out there. It's just, do you want to keep digging through, this, through the clues as they keep throwing crap on top of it, each one of them? As soon as you keep going one place, you're taken to another place, you're diverted to another place, there's a goose chase this place in that direction, that gets very confusing and can, uh, like what happened to Benowitz, throw you into a, a bad place mentally. And I just, I knew that I couldn't go there. I didn't want to go there. I, uh, I don't have much, I don't know how much time I have left in this life, but for what I have left, I want to be happy and joyful and feel friendly toward most beings as much as I can. That's the way I want to live. And that, I knew the UFO place is not the place to have that, uh, state of mind <laughs> well yeah maybe not then but maybe now <laughs> well, what do you think? how would you think Renee, that that would happen uh that working in the ufo field would bring about the kind of yes or or having a, a, some sort of open disclosure that everybody could handle well i mean you know i i you know, I don't know. I don't know about the oh, open yeah. disclosure. You're, but all I know exactly is that I think that people are more open generally to the ideas. Uh, you know, we were talking about, you know, uh, extraterrestrials, uh, visitors from other planets. But, you know, there could also be, you know, this interdimensional aspect that you're talking about. And, you know, you tackled some of that, uh, some of those uh, more far out issues uh in things that you did like your series with terrence mckenna uh, right. that you did in the magazine which was a very uh brave step because it was really sort of outside the realm of ufology as it was or as it existed at the time and it was pretty heady stuff it was heavy um, stuff for those that had not that had not had the experience of psychedelics, okay, and that that of course is another uh, area fraught with controversy and besmirched with a lot of misinformation. But to tell you the truth, it's, I'm glad you brought it up because that aspect of coverage that I did, I was I felt more comfortable with that than anything else because. The things that Terrence McKenna so so articulately described about his psilocybin experiences coordinated with what I experienced when I took psychedelics to such a degree that I could see the connection between the part of at least part of the UFO phenomenon with with mind expanding substances that could actually create. Uh, visions of things that other people can't see. In other words, hallucinations. And when you're in but that is, state... Is those... it, so if you're just hallucinating, is it something that you've manufactured in your mind? Or are you? is it really opening up? Is it really expanding your mind to allow you to see things that are there that you couldn't see just under normal circumstances? I believe the latter. Because some of the things that have been described by different people taking uh, similar psychedelic uh, substances have been the same or similar to such an extent that either our brains are connected to something otherworldly that we are able to see through the changes in chemistry that happen with those uh, drugs or substances, or we are we are able to each create from those substances uh, the ability to go out into another dimension and see what's out there. Uh, I believe I believe that it is a, a valid, absolutely a valid area of experimentation that should be allowed to take place. But again, you have the overshadowing powers that be that uh, do not want, they really, I believe there's a negative element on this planet that does not want us to be f completely free beings 
In other words, to have free and uh, open access to what our minds are capable of. And psychedelics are a door. Now, they may not be the best door. I would, I would say probably lack of any drug or mind-altering substance, but going through practice, uh, spiritual practices is probably Meditation. Better. Yeah. Yes. Meditation, spiritual exercises, a concentration on what your vision of God is, that sort of thing. But it's another avenue. And for me, when I took uh, LSD at age 18 and 19, it opened me up to something that I had never thought I would ever, ever have any kind of interest or attraction to, and that is other dimensions, the the uh, connection of every single element and atom in the, in the universe. Okay, the connection. We are so connected, and yet we feel so separate. What's wrong with experimenting under, you know, limited circumstances with a substance that can help us reach those parts of our nature? It has to be within limits, of course. It has to be, because it's dangerous at the same time. It's like the sword, you know, which can, can cut away the crap or it can kill you. You know, it's a, it's a t- double-edged sword. Uh, but, but, but our country, at least at this point in time, uh, the powers that be don't want it to go too far at all. Because, uh, after all, it's true. Our generation uh, was openly able to have it, and it destroyed some lives, people that weren't able to see the, the limits of what they could and should do with those substances. Uh, well, I think, but, yeah, I think that you have to be really careful uh, with with substances like that, because I think, you know, if you are not in a strong place right. mentally, right. I think it could like just drive you right over the edge. And I think it has done oh, that sure. to certain people. Oh, so, definitely. There's clinical boundaries that would have to be set. Oh, absolutely. Very and, and, and some people should never, ever have anything like that, ever. Okay? That's There's right. Just some people whose minds shouldn't. And others people whose minds may be up to a point. And knowing those limits, how do you discover them? These things are, it's really interesting because it's sort of like the UFO phenomenon. And that they're very much similar. It's like, how far can you go with it? Well, I found my limit. And uh, I'm sure that people that take drugs, some of them, they find their limit and they know when to stop. You know, uh, it's all has to do with your inner nature and what you're capable of holding. At least that's my opinion. Hmm. And I'm pretty opinionated, by the way. <laughs> well, I do know that, you know, back in those days, too, there was a lot of uh, uses by, you know, members of the mental health community. At one uh, point, yeah. Mm-hmm. Of, uh, yeah, LSD uh, for, you know, certain treatment of people. I knew a psychiatrist who used LSD with her patients, and she, you know, thought it was a wonderful tool. Um you know, and I guess in those circumstances, it probably was okay because if she was knew a medical doctor. What she doctor. was doing, uh, doses, dosages, uh, what the person, the set and setting. Remember Tim Leary and Richard Alpert, um, who became Baba Ram Das. Sure. Uh, some of these psychedelics do have a spiritual overtone too. They they basically came out with uh, the areas where you know you can find. Uh, Opening, open you open yourself, and there's other places where you could also close yourself off, and a, only a, a psychological professional could know, you know, how much and uh, when to to present that uh, mm-hmm. something they could take and find new places inside themselves, you know. Uh, yeah, I I kind of uh, liken it a, a bit to uh, some of the Native American vision questing. Yeah, it is. It's similar. With- with like peyote, natural uh, substances, and um, which is considered a religious sacrament to to certain uh, Native Americans, yeah, and I believe that they're allowed to to imbibe in it because it's part of their religion. But you know, it's still dicey, and I guess the FDA and the uh, drug uh, drug enforcement agency have to weigh each case as it comes along, you know, Mm. and, you know, some people uh, can handle this. Terrence McKenna was fascinating, and the reason I was fascinated with him, and and, uh, besides the fact that he had these very fascinating descriptions of of entities and UFOs that he would see while taking psilocybin, was the fact that he could take such large doses, could go so far into it, and come out of it, and be utterly 
right on top of, of things and articulate in, in describing the power behind these, these natural psychedelics. I mean, I just, he was a, he was a raconteur, Irish, of course. He could really tell a story, and he really knew how to, to weave uh, a uh, story uh, into a kind of a grandiose picture that you could put in your mind. And uh, I think that's what made him uh, such a wonderful uh, shall we say, advocate of psychedelics. Mm. <laughs> now, <laughs> you did, what did. Was that a two part series that you did in the magazine? It seems to me like it was two issues back to back. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, it was. I believe it was. Only the first one was the one that I had was actually the cover story. And then, you know, that was so exciting to me when I did it. Believe it or not, the only book I ever wrote. I, have a, I called it a book yet. Do you remember that? And it's called oh. True UFO. It was a combination of the interviews I did with uh, Terrence plus some of my own uh, head-spinning thoughts on psychedelics and UFOs. And uh, I oh. found a copy of it. It's just a uh, – Sherry. it must have been when Sherry was doing most of the, the uh, typesetting and everything when I, when I wrote it. She set up the, uh, the uh, pages the, for me. So I have it in, on pages. It's not really a book. And I put it between covers, and I may have sold a couple of, a couple of copies oh of it. Oh, my gosh. If anybody's ever interested in that, I don't know if they would be, but... Um, I, I would. Have, oh, <laughs> I'll give it to you. I've got, I've got two copies here. Oh, that'd be so, fantastic. It's I just would a love little it. book yet. It's just a small thing. It's just like some uh, more essay-type writing I did combined with an uh, interview with, with Terrence. So. But I called yeah. it True UFO, because he, he did this great book called True Hallucinations. And... Uh, and that's exactly what I see UFOs as being. It's it's true, but it has this hallucinatory aspect. It's a real phenomenon, but at the same time, it comes across unreal and not solid and ephemeral, and it does tricks, mm. you know. And uh, so there's so there's a definite uh, crossover there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Now we're down to gosh, it looks like about seven and a half minutes or maybe six and a half minutes to go. Um, and maybe some of the other things that you tackled in the magazine, like the, um, the ending of the, well, the so-called ending of the military's remote viewing program. Oh yeah. I was thinking about that. Operation Stargate. You now, were, you were, you talked to Lynn McGonagall quite a bit. Remember? Lynn Buchanan, yeah. Buchanan, I'm sorry. That's I'm right. Sorry. I did talk with Joe McMonagall. Joe McMonagall, right. But I, uh, not very, not as much, uh, but I did become friends with Lynn Buchanan. But I remember, you know, at the time, I didn't know anything about that subject at all. Uh, Fascinating subject, boy. I'll tell you. The, yeah. Now, yeah what you, to me, it's like, I don't know how we can bumble around so much with our military when they're, these capabilities seem to be, uh, you know, very usable. And, do you, and Don and I had uh, dinner one night with Ingo Swan, who actually was the founder of the Protocols. Oh, a genius. Yeah, absolutely. What a fascinating guy. And uh, you want to read a provocative book about possible UFO ET intelligence or, for him, probable, if not actual, penetration. And hopefully that's a, a book by Ingo Swan that you can find maybe uh, old copies on Amazon or something. I don't know. But that is another. He's another one. And you were asking about certain uh, cases and researches. Uh, Ingo, I have tremendous respect for. Oh, uh, he's, actually, he's not with us anymore. Uh, I think he's passed away a couple of years ago. Oh, did he ago. pass away also? Oh, I my goodness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is what happens when you get to a certain age. I Everybody know. out there. Listen, it's just life, but no matter how much it happens or how little, it just doesn't feel right. That's why I'm yeah. pretty sure that there's something beyond this life. Yeah, yeah. it looks like he passed away in, in 2013. So. Oh, it's just last year. Well, yeah. no. <laughs> what day is this? Oh, yeah. Actually, January 1st, 2015. That's oh, right. Oh, my God. Two Actually, years ago. Actually, he died... Uh, 31 January 2013, so oh, just about two oh, years boy. ago. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. yeah well, he I, was I, a very I, interesting guy. Uh, he did uh, develop, uh, or at least helped, or was part of developing those protocols that the remote viewers used. Right. Uh, 
And uh, he was also he also wrote an interesting book on Marian apparitions. I don't know if you oh did he I didn't knew know about that. that. Yeah, we actually had him on Strange Universe when I was working on that show, uh, talking about worldwide Marian apparitions. That would have been interesting. That's a, that I didn't know he was involved with that particular subject. I was kind of surprised, you know, about that. But his, his area, you know, remote viewing is just another example of where um, Charlatan stepped in. Like, um, yes, you know who I'm talking about, don't oh, you? <laughs> Ed, I know you're probably talking about Ed Dames. Ed Dames, thank you very much. You know, uh, here, here was a guy that made these outrageous predictions, which he said were based on his remote viewing and others' remote viewing, which made the whole area again sound like just crackpot stuff, you know. And uh, so that what does that do? That throws a monkey wrench into the real research in in, in normal people's just average uh, vision with their t- looking into the subject. You know, it's too bad. But um, and if, if I'm not mistaken, um, if for the military, Ed Dames was never a viewer. He was a monitor, I believe. Oh, that isn't that what came out later. I believe so. Yeah, I think you're right. Now I could yeah. be, I could be mistaken. I but I'm almost absolutely sure that he was not a remote viewer for the government, but he worked in the remote viewing uh, project. But as um, as a monitor, you know, making sure the protocols were in the place. Process, yeah. I don't right. know if it was in, was it in a professional capacity. He was like, uh, yeah. He, it was. Yeah, yeah, with the military. And he was like Skip Atwater. Right, remember right. Frederick Skip Atwater? Right, I do remember that. In fact, didn't Skip come out with one of the more uh, interesting and legitimate books about it? You know, he probably did. Uh, he, you know, continued working in the private sector on uh, remote viewing at the Monroe Institute. In, in, oh, in, that's far, right, right. As far as I know, he's still there. And, of course... Joe McMonagall, who was said to have been the best remote viewer that the military had during those years, um, married uh, Nancy Monroe, who was the either the uh, I think he was she was like the adopted daughter of Robert Monroe of the Monroe Institute. And then so and and uh, so Joe and Nancy lived nearby the institute and then continued. To work there, and in fact, I think that's where Joe was actually working when he wrote, uh, came out with his book Mind Trek. Right, right. They were doing a that, lot of. I didn't read that book, and I don't know if we ever got it. But I, I find that that whole field was very much like there was a a trend of interest in the UFO field. Do you remember that when it happened? It was like everybody was talking about remote viewing, and it was yes. like all of a sudden it was out out into the public. You know, this top secret way of spying, remote viewing spying. Oh goodness! And, Guess what, Vicky? Oh no! We are You're out kidding. of time. Oh, oh, I'm just so oh, ready for another two hours. I, I mean, know. I really am. <laughs> I'm she really lied. <laughs> Staying up past your bedtime. <laughs> yes, I am, I'm afraid. No, not quite. It's about an hour from now. So, yeah, but don't make that, don't let you, I don't want you to think that we have another hour to go. No, 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 no. Okay, no. Nope, nope. Now, this has been this a lot of fun, me. Renee. I really enjoyed this. I want to thank you. Thanks so much, and thank Dawn again for, for joining us for the last live edition of Night Vision Radio. Everybody, <laughs> Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year. 